scripture lesson this morning comes from 2 Kings chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Naaman, a general for the king of Aram, was a great man and highly regarded by his master, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. This man was a mighty warrior, but he had a skin disease. Now, Aramean raiding parties had gone out and captured a young girl from the land of Israel. She served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master could come before the prophet who lives in Samaria. He would cure him of his skin disease. So Naaman went and told his master what the young girl from the land of Israel had said. Then Aram's king said, Go ahead. I will send a letter to Israel's king. So Naaman left. He took along ten kickers of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten changes of clothing. He brought the letter to Israel's king. It read, Along with this letter, I'm sending you my servant Naaman so you can cure him of his skin disease. When the king of Israel read the letter, he ripped his clothes. He said, What? Am I God to hand out death and life? But this king writes me asking me to cure someone of his skin disease. You must realize he wants to start a fight with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that Israel's king had ripped his clothes, he sent word to the king. Why did you rip your clothes? Let the man come to me. Then he'll know that there's a prophet in Israel. Naaman arrived with his horses and chariots. He stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent out a messenger who said, Go and wash seven times in the Jordan River. Then your skin will be restored and become clean. But Naaman went away in anger. He said, I thought for sure that he'd come out, stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the bad spot and cure the skin disease. Aren't the rivers in Damascus, the Abana and the Farfar better than all Israel's waters? Couldn't I wash in them and get clean? So he turned away and proceeded to leave in anger. Naaman's servants came up to him and spoke to him. Our father, if the prophet had told you to do something difficult, wouldn't you have done it? All he said to you was wash and become clean. So Naaman went down and bathed in the Jordan seven times, just as the man of God had said. His skin was restored like that of a young boy, and he became clean. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. My grandma um, had a saying, maybe some of y'all have heard it before, um, too big for your britches. Anybody ever been too big for their britches before? Um, I have. That's how I heard it from my grandma. Um, wasn't on accident. Um, Naaman... Uh, Naaman falls victim to this vice a little bit in this passage, doesn't he? He's a little too big for his britches. Um, he's he's got a, uh, an inflated idea about himself. Um, and, and so he's, he's a little too big for his britches, so to speak. Uh, he thinks a little too much of himself, it would seem. See, Naaman may be sick. He may be untouchable because of his skin disease. He may be broken and disfigured. But he is important. Naaman is important. He's a big deal. He's a general. He wins battles. He wins battles for the king. He wins land and money and riches on behalf of his king. And the king of Aram has sent him with a sealed letter to the king of Israel. Because Naaman has heard from a servant girl in his wife's employ that there is a prophet who might can heal him in Israel. That's how much pull Naaman has. On the off chance that this servant girl that we just picked up in this raiding party is right about the prophet in Israel, the king of Aram has handwritten a letter, sealed it, and sent it to the king of Israel to say, hey, heal this guy. Just on that, the king has said, he's a big deal. So he sends him to the king of Israel. Now the king of Israel has some of his own issues, apparently, because he freaks out completely. He's forgotten that Elisha lives in his lands. Elisha, who was Elijah's 
protege, the one who asked for a double portion of Elijah's power when Elijah was taken up in the fiery chariot in glory, this same Elisha, the, the king, has somehow forgotten that Elisha is in his midst. So the, the king has his own issues. But eventually, Elisha gets word to him and says, Hey, king, don't forget about me. Just send him over here. And then this great man, this man Naaman, will know that there's a prophet, a man of God that will know that God's presence and power dwells in this place. So the king of Israel sends Naaman to Elisha. And we hear that Naaman is coming in splendor and wealth. He's bringing silver and gold and enough clothes for a pretty long time. He's coming in power. He's coming with all of his grandeur. And he comes to Elisha's door and he knocks. And basically, Elisha hollers at him through the door. It's kind of what happens. He sends a messenger, but it's the equivalent of hollering at him through the door. He hollers out, go and take a bath in the Jordan seven times. Naaman, big important Naaman. Gold, silver, clothes. Trunks full. He's got the full, his full battalion with him. He's come in power and splendor with all his servants. He comes to Elisha's door and Elisha hollers through, hey, go take a bath. Naaman's a little mad. He's a little angry. So we got good rivers in Aram. Why well, need to take a bath here? I could have taken a bath somewhere else. He didn't even come outside. He didn't even come to see all my silver and gold. He didn't even come to see all my outfits. He didn't even come to see me. He didn't wave his hands. He didn't pray real loud. He didn't call on God's name and heal the spot. He just hollered through the door and said, go take a bath. He's ready to leave. He says, what? No ritual, no prayer, no healing touch or potion or challenge or requirement. Just go do something normal seven times. This doesn't fit Naaman's stature and grandeur, at least in his own mind. And his servants, his servants have to come to him and say, are you really not going to be healed because the prescription is too simple? Are you really not going to be made well because the prescription is too simple? Say, if he'd have told you to do something hard, you'd have gone and done it immediately. You'd have made it happen so you could be healed. Are you not going to be healed of this disease that has plagued you, this disease that holds you back, this disease that's keeping you from being all that you could be because it's too easy, too simple? Then he takes a bath seven times and is healed. He is healed. We are all Naaman. Every last one of us is Naaman. We all think we are too important. We all think we're too big for our britches. Too big a deal for the simplicity of salvation. We all think we're too big a deal. The simplicity of God's grace and love and mercy. We may be sin sick, untouchable, broken, and disfigured in our resemblance to the image of God in which we were created, but we think for us, for us, salvation was much more complicated than it was. We think our importance our being more or less good, or at least normal, or our being successful or powerful or wealthy means that we earned our salvation, that we were or are worthy of it. And I know that we think we're worthy. I know that we think that we are worthy of this salvation. And I'll tell you how. Because we demand that others be worthy of it. Because when we see a brother or sister in need, 
We demand that they be worthy of God's grace before we'll hand it to them. That they live up to our definition of righteous, or at least our definition of normal. Before we'll truly accept them as children of God and as restored to the full image of God. Before we'll even talk to them about it. We want to tell them, you've got to be like us. You've got to be like me on this side of my salvation, not on the other side. You've got to be normal like I am. You've got to vote the way I do. You've got to think the way I do. You've got to hold the same beliefs, the same understandings about the world. You've got to have the same sexuality that I do or gender understanding that I do. You have to be like me in order to have this grace that I have. We make our normal our righteousness, what we conceive of as our own importance, our own worth, contingent on their receiving God's grace. We make it a requirement for them. That's how I know we think we're worthy. We think we're worthy because we've made ourselves the standard as to whether or not somebody else can experience God's salvation. We've made ourselves the standard for whether or not somebody else can receive salvation. But the truth is, is that salvation is simpler than that. It doesn't have anything to do with any of those things. It doesn't have anything to do with anything we could do or could be or could offer. Salvation is simpler than we make it. It's the simplest thing, in fact. Don't get me wrong, simple doesn't mean easy. Salvation isn't easy to understand. It's not easy to understand how Christ could do this for us. It's not easy to understand how God made it happen. It's not easy, but it's simple. It's simple in that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. None of us are worthy of it. None of us are worthy of it. None of us have earned it, and none of us can. Not the first time we accepted it, not the second, not the third. Over and over again, as God's grace is poured out on us, it is pure gift, unearned. Undeserved. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's simple. And here's the rest. To God, to God, everyone is a big deal. Even though we're sinners, even though we've fallen short of all that God had in mind for us, of all that God had in store for us, even though daily we mess up, even though daily we Put another mark in that sin category in our lives, at least one, probably more. Even though we sin and fall short of the glory of God, to God, each and every one of us is a big deal. A big deal, the biggest deal. God loves each and every one of us so much that God became one of us, lived among us, died for us, and was raised for our sight, our sake. And God has given all of us a simple way of becoming clean, whole, saved. Faith in Jesus Christ. Have faith in Jesus Christ. In his righteousness. In his life his teaching, and his cross and resurrection. Have faith in Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Have faith in Jesus Christ. Have faith and be clean. Have faith and be made whole. Have faith. Be restored to the image of God. Have faith. Know that you are loved. Have faith. Know you are a child of God. Have faith in Jesus Christ. 
what he has done and the grace he pours out and the love he bestows and the mercy that he offers and the fact that through him God's justice is satisfied, God's mercy is satisfied and God's grace is poured out on all of us in some not easy to understand kind of way but it's just that simple. Have faith in Jesus Christ. The truth of the matter is, is that our salvation is not, all, is not just personal. It is personal, but it's also social. Our salvation is contingent. We can only be as, uh, as saved as we are willing to allow for our neighbor to be saved. We can only accept the grace of God in equal measure to the amount of grace we are willing to allow our neighbor to accept. Let me see if I can get this out better. If we believe that somebody has to live up to a standard that we set, if we believe that somebody has to live the right kind of way, believe the right kind of way, think the right kind of way, vote the right kind of way in order to be considered a real Christian, to have the amount of grace poured out on them that we have poured out on us, that we believe we have poured out on us. We are limiting God's grace in our own lives and in theirs. We're holding ourselves back and we're holding them back. Holding back from them. God will find a way to spite us. But we're putting a limit on how much grace we can receive by trying to say there's a limit on how much they can have. We will never be able to fully embrace the gift of salvation for ourselves or for others unless we can accept, embrace, and entrench the simplest of truths into our life and faith and being. We don't deserve it, but God has made a way. We are not worthy, but God has allowed us in any way. We can't earn it, but God gives it freely. Have faith. In Jesus Christ, be made whole, clean, restored to the image of God in which you were created. It's available to you and to me, to anyone, anywhere, no matter what. Would you pray with me? Heavenly and Almighty God, we give you thanks for the gifts that you pour out on us, but especially for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who despite the fact that we didn't deserve you, we didn't deserve him, came and lived as one of us, knowing our fears, our doubts, our temptations, and in each and every case, responding righteously for our sake. Even to the end when he was falsely accused, wrongly condemned, put to death for our sins, for the sins of the world. So that three days later when he rose from the grave, we might all be raised into new life with him. We might all be raised into the possibility of your kingdom with him. We might all be raised to the expectation of grace and hope and new life in your name. Reveal your Holy Spirit to us and open our eyes to the ways in which we limit your grace in this world. The ways in which we try to make it contingent to being like us unlike our version of normal, righteous. Give us eyes that can see it, direct it in ourselves, and reach out with your hand and cry out with your voice to welcome all that we meet to your love, to your mercy, and into your salvation. 